Thank you. I'm sharing my slides right now. Yeah, we can see yes. this. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm glad, glad to be at least virtually here at the Harvard Symposium in 2021. Um, I'm going to be talking about the 4C Consortium. I'll be speaking along with Jeff Klan, Benji Kai, and Paul Avalok. Um, you know, this is just four people out of a, a huge consortium, about 200 people representing 350 hospitals around nine countries. So I can't obviously acknowledge everybody here. We'll spend the whole day, but thank you everyone on the phone who's helped out with 4C and others who um, couldn't join us today. So Zach mentioned in his kickoff presentation this morning, um, 4C evolved early in the pandemic back in March 2020, when a lot of us were starting to get involved in these large informatics efforts to study COVID. Um, back then, a lot of it was about, as Zach mentioned, harmonizing and aggregating data from lots of hospitals to get a large number of patients. Um, but while we were all managing our ITB2s and seeing the messiness of the data and the differences between our different institutions, we we're getting really concerned about some of the results that were coming out of sight. So um, Zach, as he mentioned, sent out an email to our academic user list. And within a few days, we assembled a Zoom call with over 100 people from around the world. And we formed a consortium for clinical con characterization of COVID-19 by EHR or 4C. Um, and a little play on words, we're foreseeing what the uh, trajectories of COVID will be and predicting outcomes. And uh, we have our website, covidclinical.net, that has a lot more information about what we're doing. So what we realized is that by pulling all this data together um, into a central repository and having other people look at it, you're losing all that local knowledge. Um, each hospital is a little bit different. The way you code data, the nuances of the data are only kind of known by the local data experts and the people who work with that data locally. And if you just copy data out and think every hospital is the same, you lose a lot of that information that has a lot of insights into what's going on. So kind of our goal here in 4C was to engage local experts, not just us informaticians, but also statisticians and clinical experts forming a triad at each of our different hospitals around the world to iteratively improve site data quality, to gain trust in the data, and to conduct rapid analysis on COVID-19 to a federated model and patient chart review. So it's all about us, instead of pulling data together and having a central group looking at it, being able to federate this out have the local experts run analyses locally on their own data sets and um, look at the, the data as a, as a community that way. So it's all about staying close to the data. In 4C, we have two different kinds of analyses we do. We call them phase one studies and phase two studies. Phase one studies are looking at broad um, patterns across the diversity across the United States, as well as global perspectives. And in, in phase one studies, we ask hospitals to do very little, just run some SQL queries on their ITB2, generate aggregate count. This is not patient level data, they can share it with us centrally. And then we all kind of look at each other's aggregate data together to get some um, a good sense of what's going on. It's low regulatory barriers to participation because we're not asking anyone to install software or um, uh, do anything that uh, might require complex IRB protocols. So we're able to scale out really large. So we've, at this point now, have over 340 hospitals. Even as Zach mentioned, just within 30 days, we had um, over 100 hospitals that were participating. Um, the problem is you can only go so far with aggregate counts. So in order to validate the algorithms we're doing and take a deeper dive into um, the patient data, we run phase two studies. So phase two studies, we don't need 350 hospitals. We take subsets of sites. Um, that are best suited to answer certain research questions, we take deep dives into their patient level data. So we extract from ITB2 the patient level data set. We might run machine learning algorithms on that data, and we often engage the clinicians to do some manual chart review to make sure that the results that we're seeing actually match what's going on with those patients. Um, you can get into a real mess by sending software out to lots of different sites, where each site has different environments and different software and you don't really know what's going on. So what we do is we distribute a Docker image that has all the components we need, um, libraries and so on for sites to run our scripts in a consistent way. 
Um, in the federated model, we're asking sites to run the analyses locally and only share the aggregate counts and statistics. Even in phase two studies, we only want the final results. We're, we're never asking sites to share patient level data. We want the local data experts and clinicians to help us refine these questions. They know the local coding practices and they can perform the chart review to help us ensure that the results that we're seeing are, are correct. And finally, in the federated approach, we can actually go back and correct the data. Um, as we look at each other's aggregate results, we see all sorts of outliers. We can go back and either confirm them or actually fix it. Once your data is copied into some other location and, and, and massaged and corrected there, you don't know what happened um, uh, locally. So this process of iteratively fixing problems will improve um, our methods and help us gain trust in the finding. Some key insights that we've learned through this method are um, as follows. We saw that EHRs vary greatly in availability, coding, and quality of ICU ventilation and death. So Jeff will talk a lot more about this, but a lot of the initial endpoints that we were looking at, um, like um, I have here ICU or death, are coded in very inconsistent ways across the site. And, they, and a lot of institutions don't even have this available, it's embedded in notes or in separate systems from the main EHR. So we developed a set of proxy codes, things like diagnoses and laboratory tests, which are more easily available within our sites and more consistently coded across sites that can get us the same kind of information. Another challenge is harmonizing laboratory tests. It's, um, it's very difficult. It don't, not only varies across institutions, but even within an institution, the same laboratory tests may be reported using different units depending on when it was done and what kind of machine was, um, was, uh, was measuring the test results. So local knowledge is essential for doing this cleanup and harmonization. Um, Paul will talk later about race and ethnicity coding. Um, this also varies by hospital and has different meanings in different countries. The race and ethnicity codes we use in the United States are very different than how um, other countries think about uh, this topic. And finally, algorithms that we developed early in the pandemic degrade in accuracy over time. Uh, we had early measures of um, disease severity and based on just how the pandemic and the healthcare systems have evolved over the past year, we've had to maintain, we've had to make changes to these um, algorithms in order to maintain their accuracy. Phase one studies start with their EHR data, these are loaded into an ITB2 and sometimes OMOP repositories. We have sites to run database scripts that generate aggregate accounts that are stored in plain CSV files. Um, different files are asked, looking at different dimensions of these patients, whether it's um, by calendar date counts or by the day of their admission and so on. These files are uploaded to our central um, consortium website where they're validated and we use interactive visualizations. We look at these again as a community and uh, we, we're open and honest about things. So we see some weird data point at some institution. We had the person on the phone who's able to go back and check their um, ETL process to make sure that um, the data are correct. But we'll keep going back and forth on this with um, every site until we're confident that what we're seeing is, uh, is accurate. Um, this, uh, this method allows us to get some early insights really quickly. Our first paper, our phase 1.0 study, um, Doc mentioned was out in, in only four weeks. It looked at lab trajectories in 27,000 patients with COVID-19. It was later, several months later, published in Nature Digital Medicine. And uh, our phase 1.1 study, where we're looking at um, predicting COVID-19 disease based on laboratory test trajectories, uh, at that point, we're up to 36,000 patients who are admitted and 342 hospitals in eight countries. And um, that's been out in the Med Archive for a number of months as well. So uh, just going into a little bit of detail about that study, and I think shang Chi will go a lot, we'll discuss much more about our clinical results. Um, we developed uh, an algorithm to distinguish patients who develop severe disease or never develop severe COVID disease. We're looking at if we whether our laboratory tests can predict whether patients fall into those two groups. And we did find a number of laboratory tests where there was pretty clear differences between um, the severe and non-severe patients. An important finding of it was that um, a lot of these laboratory tests were equally predictive of se disease severity, whether or not you measured them on the first day of admission or a week or two later. 
Um, some of them improved a little bit over time, others degraded, but in, in general, um, you could look at any point in their clinical visit, see the laboratory test, and have an understanding of their disease severity. Another important finding was, especially early on in the pandemic, we were seeing very different differences between countries in terms of um, uh, what patients were getting COVID and what uh, the death rates were. So we're wondering, is this population differences between countries, or is it differences in just how patients are being treated? And what we found is that there was more variability between hospitals within a country than between countries themselves. So um, North America and Europe, when we look at averages, they're about the same, but when we look within the spread, there's huge differences. So one hospital to the next, just within the United States, for example, there may be very big differences in how patients are being treated and what their um, demographics and survival rates are. Phase two studies I mentioned take a deeper dive using patient level data, machine learning, and chart review. Um, there are three different kinds of phase two studies we look at. One are projects to refine and validate our methods. So we run an aggregate query study in phase one based on some initial algorithm that we develop. And then we do a chart review to make sure those algorithms are correct and if they need to be adjusted over time. And then we can go back and, uh, and fix the algorithms in our next phase one study. So Jeff will be talking about work we did to develop a disease severity algorithm. And thank you, we'll be talking about some of the longitudinal analyses and methods we use there. Another group of studies looks at understudied and underrepresented populations. And Paul will be talking about pediatrics and uh, race and ethnicity. And then uh, we won't be going into it too much today, but there are a number of projects on disease specific diagnoses, risk factors, management, and outcomes. We have a large working group that's looking at neurological diseases and acute kidney injury disease, a thrombotic event group, and um, others. And if you're interested in creating a working group, join our 4 consortium, and you could lead one of these um, working groups that address the research study that um, you may be interested in. Um, next steps are post-acute sequelae. So the next steps for everybody as the acute phase um, starts to diminish in the United States and other countries, what we're seeing is there's an increasing number of patients that are suffering from post-acute sequelae or long COVID symptoms. Um, again, we have phase one and phase two studies working on this. Phase one studies based on large number of hospitals and aggregate are looking at the trajectories of post-acute sequelae over time and how this varies by country, race, ethnicity, and age. In phase two, where we can take a deeper dive into the data, we want to know if chart review and information in cl clinical notes can help distinguish post-acute sequelae from pre-existing comorbidities. This past year was really complicated in doing EHR studies not only because of all the new COVID patients, but also patients were staying out of the hospital. So other diseases looked like diseases people were very, like very people healthy very, very because they weren't, um, uh, weren't going to the hospital. But now as hospitals reopened and people are getting vaccinated, they're starting to see surges and other kinds of things. And it's very difficult to, to, to find control groups to be able to distinguish what are actual post-acute sequelae and what are just sort of returning to um, normal for patients or kind of... Uh, bounce back from the closures that we're seeing in the hospitals. The other thing are post-acute sequelae due to COVID-19 or the treatments, such as ventilation that are given to patients. When you're only looking at one uh, country like the United States, these kind of questions can be difficult to answer because the standard of care and every patient across all different hospitals are being treated in a somewhat similar kind of way. Um, by having a, a international consortium where we see different countries that have uh, their, their waves of COVID at different periods of time, they have different treatments that are available, we're able to help distinguish a little bit between the, the effects of the disease and the, helps of, and the effects of the treatment. So that's kind of an overview of what 4C is and the differences between phase one and phase two. And um, we will um, we'll see if there's any questions for me before we switch over to our other speakers.